Look at that, look at that right there. Anybody know what this is? Clover. It's a little bit of flour from clover, right? This is where I got this. From a preschool child. I did not. That would have been even better. <laughs> I got it from a preschool child. <laughs> the ones I get come from preschool. Oh, that's great. That actually makes the point even better. I appreciate you bringing that out, get, getting it from a preschool child. Uh, I got this out here just as I got out of my car, um, just in the grass, all right? And it's, it's, it's actually, if you just stop and notice it, it's beautiful. There's so many features of life that um, we just overlook them. We, are, we get used to things. And a very important part of life is learning to, to dig in and, and see things. And, and one, of the, one of the difficulties we have as people of faith is that in the same way that um, my tendency is to not even notice this flower on clover, I can read scripture over and over again and not see it either. Uh, God cannot be speaking to you even though you're reading it. And one of the challenges is to break that cycle. And so that's part of what we're, that's part of the purpose for me anyway, of teaching this class is for uh, the reading of scripture to come alive to you, for me to try to show you one or two uh, insights that maybe you've never noticed before. Uh, so I'm very intentionally trying to do my best to cover some familiar ground, but in covering familiar ground to hopefully surface some, some details that you haven't seen before so that you can see the richness of scripture. And last but not least, it's not just, uh, reading scripture is not just an academic exercise. Although what we do on Wednesday nights here might feel like an academic exercise, I'm trying to help you understand that these are the things that can actually root you to the ground and root you to God. Uh, if God is your rock, if Jesus is your rock, then these are the principles in which that we learn to rely upon to sustain us in our trust of God. So this flower actually has to do that. This flower right here, there's a way that scripture over and over and over again will talk about uh, ideas like this. Uh, you will reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. God reaps what he sows as well. And that's a principle. And anytime that I have found myself being uh, discouraged, uh, by not being able to see the outcome of an event, I always rely upon the fact that if I will just get out of bed and I will work hard, I will work hard. I don't know what the outcome will be, but I know that you reap what you sow. I know that. I can trust that. And it proves itself over and over again in a lot of different ways. If you want to open up your Bibles tonight to 2 Kings 23, 29, we're going to come back to these ideas that I just mentioned in a minute. Uh, we're leaving them where they were, just kind of floating, okay? Second Kings is where we're going to be tonight. and I'm not going to rehash everything that we've done, but I think that we're around uh, week seven of this class. Week seven, something like that. And I think we've got about 12 weeks total that we're going to be able to do this. So we're past the halfway point but we've covered a lot of time and a lot of history. And I told you about a month ago that, that I didn't want us to go too far through this history uh, and, and just skip over Josiah. And Josiah was one of the kings uh, that we read about in chapter 22 and in chapter 23, who's really one of the high points in terms of people who follow God. But before we do that, before we read any from 2 Kings, let me ask you a question. I've got to, uh, and once again, those of you who are, who are tuning into this class um, through Zoom as a Zoom meeting, if there's something that you want to say to me, uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm less likely to quickly pick up on the chats. Um, I'll try to notice that, but I might miss it. But you can hit your space bar and you can comment. And I think I have uh, the volume all the way up so that I can hear you if you, want to, if you do want to comment. When I say Armageddon, what, what do you, what that comes to mind? There's not a right or wrong answer. End of, the world. End of the world, destruction, anybody else? Anybody? Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Okay, anybody else? Anybody? 
Well, for this, it's for Josiah's kill. Okay, okay, there we go. Uh, that's one that doesn't quickly come to mind, doesn't it? So we kind of have to dig a little deeper. It's like, well, I think we've said it all, haven't we? Destruction, end of the world, spiritual war. <laughs> what else is there? How about location? <laughs> uh, that, that's one that we're dealing with, and uh, that is where Josiah dies in, in the story that we're looking at right here. Josiah dies at Megiddo. Megiddo. And we'll, you know, how do you get from Armageddon from Megiddo? We'll, we'll get there in a minute. But what I'm going to do tonight is just tell you some of the passages that you'll want to read to dig into this. Like I said, 2 Kings 21 through 23. 21 is really about two different kings of Judah. And remember, Judah, is it the northern or the southern kingdom? Southern. That's right. And at this point in the history of the kingdom of Israel, as we would loosely say, there is no northern kingdom anymore. They're already gone, right? 722, they collapsed. And so we just have Judah remaining. Manasseh, at the beginning of chapter 1, is by far the worst king that we have had. Um, Manasseh does atrocious things. He even offers his son or sons as sacrifices. He not only raises some of the holy places, he builds holy locations for all of the other gods in the region. Killing your children to appease the pagan gods, you know, the false gods, that's just incredible. Incredible. That's Manasseh. Then after Manasseh's Ammon. Ammon's so bad, they only let him reign for two years. The people are like, enough, enough, enough. And then what happens? Josiah, I think he's, what, eight years old? <laughs> they put an eight-year-old on the throne. An eight-year-old on the throne is better than Ammon, <laughs> just to kind of put it in context here. And Josiah, probably the most famous things that he does is this long story beginning in verse 3 all the way through the end of the chapter of 22 is they find the book of the law. Scholars have gone over this and talked about it time and time again, and they feel fairly certain that what was discovered at this point in time would have been the book of Deuteronomy. We're not going to talk about that right now because it's a whole other story, a whole different class. But they find this basically in the walls associated with the temple. And they start reading it, and they're like, wow, there's all kinds of stuff that we should have been doing, and we're not doing it. Now, this is the part of the class that, that many of us are probably familiar with. Some of us may not be. But Josiah starts all of these reforms in chapter 23, trying to improve things, bring things closer back to God, trying to be a judicious and good ruler and a good leader. And so he does all kinds of stuff. So if you want to, we can read just a little bit of the story just so you can get a sense of it. So let's start in uh, 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's start reading in verse 3. And let's, um, uh, let's go to 23. Let's read chapter 23, verse 1. How about that? We'll start in verse 1 and just read some in chapter 23. Anybody want to read? Now it came about in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe. To the time out, time out. With 2 Kings 22, 23. 23, I'm sorry. Yeah, I kind of ran all that together. <laughs> We're going to read 2 Kings 23, beginning in verse 1. My apologies. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Round two. Then the king sent, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets and all the people both small and great and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the lord and the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the lord to walk after the lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people entered into the covenant then the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, for Asherah, for all the hosts of heaven, 
and he burned them outside Jerusalem in the field of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he did away with the idolatrous priests whom the king of Judah had appointed to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the surrounding area of Jerusalem. Also, those who burn incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, and to the constellations, and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem to the brook Kidron, and burned it at the brook Kidron, and ground it to dust, and threw its dust on the graves of the common people. He also broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes which were in the house of the Lord, where the women were weaving hangings for the Asherah. Then he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba down to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gates, which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, and were on one's left at the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not go up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brothers. He also defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire for Moloch. And he did away with the horses which the king of Judah had given to the son at the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the official, which was in the precincts, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. And the altars which were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down, and he smashed them there, and threw their dust into the brook Kidron. And the high places which were before Jerusalem, which were on the right of the Mount of Destruction, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, the abomination of the sons of Ammon, the king defiled. And he broke in pieces the sacred pillars, and cut down the ashram, and filled their places with human bones. Furthermore, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made, even that altar and the high place he broke down. Then he demolished its stones, ground them to dust, and burned the ashram. Now when Josiah turned, he saw the graves that were there on the mountain, and he sent and took the bones from the graves, and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these things. Then he said, What is this monument that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the grave of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, Let him alone, let no one disturb his bones. So they left his bones undisturbed with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. And Josiah also removed all the houses of the high places which were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made provoking the Lord, and he did to them just as he had done in Bethel. And all the priests of the high places who were there, he slaughtered on the altars and burned human bones on them, and then returned to Jerusalem. Okay, excellent. So tell me, tell me what, what you just read. What is, what's happened here? In general, yeah, Josiah. I, I think uh, this is he's 26 years old and he's restoring everything, he's destroying all of these things that uh, are an abomination, is a word you could use to God, uh, of things that are disloyal to Jehovah. What else do you see? Anything? What are some of the things in particular that you saw that? That might have stuck out to you as interesting. You mentioned the man of God, like we talked about. Okay, before. yeah. Well, here's the man of God for, from a few weeks ago. I think that was First Kings, or was it Second Kings 13? Yeah. Um, the man of God who tells Jeroboam basically a prophecy, and Jeroboam mm -hmm. uh, sticks out his hand, and his hand seizes up, and that whole story. So here we have his ashes. This is years later. Uh, probably this is probably. Uh, we're talking about uh, around the 600 or uh, like 625 to 650, that range. So 300 years later, you know. So that's kind of cool, you know. What else did you see? He utterly destroys everything like God commanded. 
Yeah, he does. And what are, what are some of those things that he destroys? What are some of the things? The altars and temples of the false gods. Yeah, altars and temples. Yeah, this is a pretty this is a pretty major demolition project, isn't it? <laughs> so it's not slaughtering the priests that were serving there. Yeah, this is a day of reckoning. Day of reckoning, and it's not just uh, repealing the law, but it's actually trying to do things that will permanently keep it from happening again. Y'all understand what I mean by that? I mean, you could like change the laws, but not actually change any infrastructure. And then the next king that comes around can just, just as quickly turn it back around. Well, he's, he's making that impossible. Or there's going to have to be a major construction project, which requires revenue, which requires taxes, which means it will be very unpopular. <laughs> you see, he's making it difficult doesn't just demolition he takes everything to ashes and he's Ta yeah to be reconstructed and yeah it. yeah and, and it's very interesting in scattering all of it because you know one of the most interesting things to me about archaeological sites the world over is uh it's very very common for you to see the remains of one temple as some of the concrete or the walls or the stones of new buildings now, it might be Farmer Joe who just found a few buildings or found a few stones over in the field when they had temp toppled over that temple some years ago and that he's put them in. He needed some for his house, right? But you see that all over the world. You find remains of old temples and structures. But in this case, he's grinding it to stone, scattering it, just completely pulverizing this. So there's not even going to be the possibility of uh, a reconstruction is really what we're getting at here. That's fascinating. Okay, so let's go for a little bit further in the story. Um, they celebrate Passover in verse 21. Uh, let's start reading verse 21. Let's go all the way down through uh, 27. Anybody wanna read that? Okay, go ahead. And the king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. For no such Passover has been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel, or during all the days of the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household goods and the idols and all the abomination that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah, the priest, found in the house of the Lord. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. Now, time out right there. Did y'all catch that? Oh, yes. Okay, y'all have seen that before, hadn't you? Okay. Yeah, that's right. Deuteronomy 6. He's very loyal to Deuteronomy 6 here, which becomes very important for us later, right? Jesus summarizes the entirety of the law with this right here, combined with one other passage from Leviticus 19.18. that has to do with uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. But anyway, uh, so Josiah is really committed. He's really committed. All right, let's keep going. According to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath, by which his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. That's good. What's fascinating here is that, sadly enough, in spite of all that Josiah did. You know, some things can't actually be undone so easily. If you didn't know this, know it now. <laughs> um, you know how sometimes they'll, they'll talk about this in Kings as well as in Deuteronomy, uh, how people will be punished to the fourth generation. And there's a, a couple of different ways uh, to look at that. One way to look at that is kind of a prophetic telling, well, you're going to be punished to the fourth generation, you know, but, but the other part of it that's actually very practical is 
there are things that you will do and do in your life that you will see the fruit of it for four generations. It's kind of a horrifying thought, isn't it? But don't be, don't have no fear. It's also a good thing. <laughs> the good things about you can be seen for four generations as well. But in this case, what Manasseh had done was so consequential that it couldn't just so quickly be turned around. So we read now, turn to verse 28. We're going to read verse 28 and 29. And 29 is the verse that we're going to, or verse 30, 29 and 30. We'll read all three, three of these verses. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him. But when Pharaoh Necho met him at Megiddo, he killed him. His servants carried him dead in a chariot from Megiddo, brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own tomb. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, anointed him and made him king in place of his father. So ends uh, the story of Josiah right here. You can read a second accounting of it in Chronicles if you're so inclined to look at that passage as well. But what's interesting here, and this is what I want to pick up and sort of run with it for just a few minutes, is this, this whole idea of him dying at Megiddo. And, what's, and we're going to talk about Megiddo for just a few minutes, okay? And then from that, if you understand, at some point you're anticipating we're going to go to the New Testament, right? It's with Megiddo that we're going to do that. So if you look on a map, Megiddo is not necessarily a significant city in the history of Israel. It's significant because it is at a major crossroads for traffic and trade. If you were to look at a map, the, one of the most important land routes that connects Anatolia, which is Turkey, that's where the Hittites were from. It connects Anatolia to Egypt, to the Far East. And in this case, we're thinking Assyria, Babylon, Sumer, that whole area. There's a road that goes right through the northern part of Israel through Megiddo. There's a plain, there's a plain there, very easy passage. So several significant events happen at Megiddo simply because it is a place where traffic is coming and going, just to be blunt about it. And that's where King Josiah falls. And a sad, sad day. For those who love Yahweh, this is a very sad day, right? Well, what's interesting about Megiddo is it doesn't show up a lot in Scripture, but it does show up in enough places that it allows us to see a little bit of a landscape to the point that hundreds of years later, it has some resonance to Jews who think and read scripture and are thinking about God. And I'm talking about the New Testament time period. In particular, while because we, we only have just a few minutes on these nights, if you turn to Judges chapter four and five, you have a beautiful story that we don't have time to relate, where it talks about when Deborah was serving Israel as essentially a judge and a great victory comes about through Deborah and Barak's overcoming of some of their Canaanite opponents. And it's this very graphic story, to be blunt about it, where Sisera, the leader of the opposing forces, they're being routed by Deborah and Barak, Barak and, and he's fleeing and he tries to take refuge in a lady's uh, home or tent, jail. And while he's sleeping, she drives a stake through his head, kills him. So you might have heard that story before, or you might have seen some of the art, which is even more graphic than the telling of the story. But there's some famous paintings of this. Then in chapter five, the same story is kind of told poetically the song of Deborah. And what's fascinating in the song of Deborah, if you go to chapter 5, verse 19, read verse 19 with me. It says, the kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan, 
at Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. The stars fall from heaven from their courses. They fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away, the onrushing torrent. The torrent Kishon march on my soul with might. Where do these things happen? At the waters of Megiddo. Now, if you were to travel to Israel today, you can still go to Megiddo, and it actually goes by the name, uh, what, Tel Megiddo? You can Google these things, you know. But a Tel is a site in a place like Palestine where a culture will build a city. When it's destroyed due to warfare, they'll build another one right on top of it. And Megiddo is one of those sites that has something like 26 different layers of civilization. So it's kind of a, from an archeologist's point of view, it's like a dream dig, right? <laughs> I mean, one layer after another. But that's where this is happening. This very significant event in Israel's past in Judges four and five happens there. Then we know the very catastrophic event that we just read about of Josiah falling uh, there to King Necho of uh, the Pharaoh. And then when you turn over to the prophets, Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 11, which while I would love to dig into Zechariah tonight, chapter 7 through the end of the book become pivotal for, uh, for early Christian readings of the Messiah, okay? The last part of Zechariah. And then the one that we're looking at here in chapter 12, if I can get there, it's kind of far over there. Isaiah, Jeremiah, help me, Ezekiel. Eleven. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem, he has drank this morning of Hadad, Rimon, in the plain of Megiddo. Ah, Megiddo shows up again. You see, in verse 10, one of the reasons this is important, I want you to notice something in verse 10. You can see that the early Christians would have liked this passage. And I will pour out a spirit of compassion and supplication on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that when they look on the one whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Early Christians read this passage, and who do they see? The one who's pierced? Jesus. But you go all through Zechariah and you see stuff like this. It's really cool. But anyway, in this passage, these two verses that we're reading here, it's talking about how God is going to allow Jerusalem to one day be victorious again. One day Judah will rise up. One day a spirit of compassion and grace is going to overflow in Judah and then verse 11, the passage we just read, and on that day, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadad, Rimon, and the plain of Megiddo. Now, there's a lot of discussion over who Hadad, Rimon is, and we're not going to get into that here, but a lot of people say he's really referring to Josiah, the morning that took place. It's the day that Judah realizes that they had Yahweh the whole time on their side, but they'd gone through years, decades, even centuries not knowing who they had at their disposal, not being aware of it. And the day that they realized that God was always there was the day that they would mourn deeply and realize, oh boy, have we missed this. Megiddo. So here's where we, we go with it. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. Revelation 16, 16. I don't really have to tell y'all about Revelation 16 because y'all have already told me <laughs> at the beginning of class. Armageddon, which comes from the Hebrew, Har Megiddo, uh, two different words. Uh, and some people say it comes from the city of Megiddo or it could refer to the mountain of Megiddo. Two possibilities that we have there. But in Revelation 16, 16, without going into great depth, I think that you realize that this moment is being uh, talked about here, beginning in verse 12, an event at the great river Euphrates, and there's this great battle that's going 
to take place. In verse 16, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And this great battle is supposed to unfold here. Some people have read this and said, you know what? I think there's going to be a great battle at the end of time. And it's going to be at Megiddo where all the forces of good will oppose the forces of evil. I suppose that's one possible reading of this passage. I think that in terms of likelihood, you know, high probability, is this a 90%? Ah, oh, this is more like 3%, right? That's probably not the best reading of this. If you get, if you have some type of understanding of the book of Revelation, you'll figure out real quickly that anytime you start reading too much in the book, literally, you're probably missing the mark. It's very symbolic. It's a very symbolic book. So what is it talking about? Jeremy, yeah, go ahead. You, um, if you didn't look it up, would you see in the scripture mm -hmm. to know that um, Megiddo is the same thing as Armageddon? They're the same place? Is there any way? You know, if you didn't know, just study tools is the only th thing that I would know that you would have access to to figure that out. Yeah, or you can learn it. Hebrew. <laughs> maybe, maybe a lot of people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not self-evident, is it? And a lot of times words that are like, like it's A-R, well, that's actually a, a rough A. We would say har, harmageddon, you know. Now, we wouldn't know that either, would we? Not just if you're just reading at face value, but there's where the, a little bit of digging comes in, a little bit deeper beyond the surface. And all of a sudden, we begin to realize that Armageddon, this location seems to probably represent this crossroads of forces of evil and forces of good where there will be a confrontation and guess who wins? <laughs> guess who wins? That's right. And we is assuming you're on God's side. <laughs> Yahweh. Yahweh wins. Yahweh wins. Now, we need to talk about this for just a few minutes, uh, but before we, before we wrap things up, what are some of your thoughts? We, we, I just dump a lot of information out there for you. So just to summarize, Judges 4 and 5, then we have 2 Kings 21, 22, and 23. We also have Zechariah chapter 12, verse 11. We have Revelation 16, 16. And there's, there's other passages too, but that's enough. Uh, any thoughts, questions, comments? I have a question over here. Yeah. Uh, this, you know, Megiddo, uh, or Megiddo, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of battles over the millennia from there. Yeah. And I think that's one reason the uh, symbolism is used in Revelation. Mm -hmm. and, and up to the Jew at this time, they were probably thinking back to Joshua mm -hmm. when he took the city. And then later on, Solomon in first Kings, he fortified the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two more references for us. Good, good. It's a very significant place and comes to mind in the Jewish records as it's an event of battles, the crossroads. The crossroads. Other questions, comments. That's good. That's good. Thank you for, for adding that. Anybody? I don't know if this has anything to do with the location or not, but I can't you know, for the life of me understand why Josiah went to the mountain. Yeah. No, that's a good question. All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes when we, sometimes our questions, we, I think asking questions is critical for better Bible reading. And sometimes the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. Why did he do that? Go ahead. So one thing that's interesting is when Josiah reigned, Jeremiah was a prophet. Mm -hmm. And Jeremiah, he realized what was going on in Judah. And it's all that one that was going to know why God did destroy everyone. Right. But uh, my question is, the way God intervened back in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and he had Josiah that was uh, waging a high spirit of reformation over what Manasseh had done for 50 years. Mm -hmm. Why did he save Josiah? Yeah. 
Okay. okay. That's it. Worse. There we go. We're, we're actually we're actually teasing out a riddle right now. And if you didn't hear his question, if if the if if this location, Megiddo, sort of ends up symbolizing where God wins, why does Josiah lose? But here's the interesting thing. God does win in the case of Josiah dying there. What do you mean? The, the most difficult part about life, or one of the most difficult parts about life, and remember this, is surrendering to God's will. That is one of the most difficult things to do in the entirety of your human existence. Because what that means, what that means is you must trust him. When you surrender to God's will, you trust that just like God can bring this flower out in the spring like he always does. You see, what that story with Josiah is about is it's not just God's wrath, it's actually God's justice. You can depend upon God to be just. And then from time to time, what does he do? He throws out mercy instead. Mercy doesn't undo justice, right? It's, it's an abundance to it. It's a graciousness of God. You can expect God to bring justice. And in the case of Josiah, he brought justice too, which was unfortunate for Josiah himself. But... <clears throat> It's going to happen. God's justice will come out. That's what Armageddon is about, too. Justice will happen. Now, let me uh, close with just a thought. And um, there's a there's an occasion where I had I was on a thirty day hike. Uh, thir not thirty day. <laughs> that would have been long. Thirty mile hike, five days scouts hiking in the smoky mountains which is one of the things that we commonly do and we had hiked up up to about 5,000 feet going over the low gap and we're descending down into the next river valley the big creek and off to one side you see mount sterling and then you see the balsam mountain ridge behind you and mount git with the fourth highest peak in the eastern united states to another side of you and several other old black that peak is just looming over you and you're right down there in the center of this little valley and this Roaring Creek, they call it Big Creek for a reason. It's just the bumbling brook and the noise. And it's a Sunday morning, about 6.30 in the morning, we're doing uh, scout zone. And we've assembled around a fire pit, four boys, two adults, both adults, I being one of them, members of Churches of Christ. And, and we're leading them in a voluntary service, worship service. And of the four of them, none of them are associated with our customs and habits, but they're open to it, and, and uh, we have a small service. And while we were there, I encouraged them to look at the trees. We had old growth forests all around us. I'm talking about trees this big around, you know, massive uh, fir trees and spruce trees and tulip poplars, just incredible, incredible trees. And they just extend so high. And so you're looking up and you see these massive treetops, 60, 70 feet up in the air. And then off in the distance, you see these mountain peaks looming over you. And in this setting, as we're looking at these trees, I told the boys about an event that happened back in 2011 where I had been asked to speak at a conference in Tarragona, Spain. Tarragona, Spain is on the Mediterranean side, that is the eastern side of Spain, and it is the ancient seaport of Rome. When they originally took Spain, they had their city, Toraco, first located there, and it's been a city ever since. And I was going there to speak at this conference, but before the conference came about, my wife and I flew into Barcelona, into the heart of Catalonia. We had just a day or two before we went south, to that old Roman port, Tarragona. And while we were there, of course, there are a few things in Catalonia you must do. Paella is one of them. It's basically a rice dish with lots of different types of seafood. And there's also one or two sites that you must see. One of them, Sagrada Familia. It's a cathedral that's been built there that the tallest spires 
if I remember correctly, are about the height of two football fields, 600 feet, massive. Designed by an architect by the name of Gaudi, a Catalan himself. And they broke ground on it in 1882 and it is still under construction. When will it be done? Sometime after 2026. <laughs> but that's how these cathedrals go, right? But what's fascinating about Gaudí's architecture is that he often used very, very organic looking materials. His designs are very organic. So when you go into this cathedral, and normally when you go into these cathedrals, you can see these massive columns lining the center aisle where all of the seating is. But in this case, these massive columns that rise before you in some ways resemble trees. They look like massive trees. And as, of course, these, these cathedrals are designed to cause you to cast your eyes upward and only at the upper limits do you see stained glass with the light coming in and it's so dark and dreary down below. And what are you forced to do? You're looking up to God, so to speak. It's unbelievable. I encourage you to Google it. Look at it. Marvel at the, the brilliance and the beauty of this architecture. And I was telling them about this, and I said, and when I'm out here in the Smokies, and I see these trees, it's the same type of effect. All of a sudden, I feel so small and so part of God's creation. God's creation. That doesn't have to just be experienced or seen in the great old growth forests of the world, but can be seen even in the delicacy of flowers like this. God's beautiful designs, if we just open our eyes and see them. What in the world does this have to do with our passage? I can tell you very quickly. You can trust God that his will will be done. You reap what you sow, why? Because it is a principle of justice that God laid out from the foundations of the earth and everything that you see depends upon it, whether it be moral truths or whether it be physical truths and you can trust it. In the same way we read these stories of Armageddon, don't think death, destruction into the world, think God will do the right thing and I can trust him. You see what I'm saying? That's what it's about. It's not about fear. It's actually about the opposite of fear. It's about comfort. Because oftentimes we are the small one. We are the vulnerable one. We are the one who no one is there to protect us. But do not forget that God will protect his people. You don't necessarily know how. You just have to put your trust in him. So that's what I hope that you'll see when you look at some of these passages. Let's close with a prayer, and, and, uh, and, that, and that's our class for the night. Almighty God, we thank you for this time that we have to study your scriptures. They're so rich and so beautiful, and we're so thankful for these wonderful, wonderful gifts and insights that you provided for us. Lord, help us to surrender to you. Help us to put our trust in you, to realize that you are just, that your will will be done, that the principles of sowing and reaping are true always because you made it so and we can trust you. Thank you for this gift of life that we have. and We thank you so much for so many gifts of life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.